A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand it only in a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace. Emmanuel Goldstein, The Theory and Practice of Oligarchical Collectivism. Hello again and welcome back. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' great novel. Chapters 51 through 53 of Don Quixote Part II conclude Sancho's rule over Barataria. In other words, the climax of the novel's political allegory. Note that the novel is decidedly epistolary here. Chapter 51 opens with a review of Cervantes' meditation on politics, circa 1614. First, he recalls politics generally, for after Sancho makes his rounds, the mayordomo spends the rest of the night writing to the Duke and Duchess about the governor's paradoxical rule, because his words and actions were all mixed up with indications of both discretion and idiocy. Did you know? The epistolary novel is a genre built upon a series of letters, epistles, written by its characters. The most famous example from Golden Age Spain is Cárcel de Amor, 1492, by Diego de San Pedro. Second, Cervantes recalls Barataria's Byzantine love narrative, for the steward spends the night, his thoughts occupied by the face, initiative, and beauty of the disguised damsel. Finally, he recalls classical political philosophy's metaphor of medicine for Sancho wants food, which in turn allows Pedro Recio to affirm that small and delicate morsels revived the wit, which was precisely what was needed for persons assigned to high commands and serious offices. As a glimpse of Cervantes' cynicism, the narrator calls Recio's reasoning nonsense, sophistry, and tells us that Sancho, in his heart, he cursed the governorship. Quixotic mission. What kind of a discourse dominates the political treaties of classical antiquity? A. Amorous. B. Culinary. C. Medical. Correct answer, C. Medical. Now Sancho confronts a final riddle. The last test of his capacities as governor is a philosophical paradox designed to paralyze Sancho's ability to reason and immobilize him like Buridan's ass. A foreigner tells Sancho about a noble's estate divided by a river. This lord has placed a gallows and a tribunal at one end of a bridge, and he has established a law whereby anyone wishing to cross must declare first his intentions. If the traveler tells the truth, he may pass. If he lies, he is to be hanged. A man declares, that he was going to die on that gallows over there. It's a paradox. According to the law, if the judges let the man go free, then they must hang him. And if they hang him, then they must let him go free. Sancho first acts like Solomon splitting the baby, a reference to 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 16 through 28. Of this man, that part which swore the truth, they should allow to pass, and that which told the lie, they should hang. But this hilarious sophistry will only kill the man, thus breaking the law. It will be necessary that this man be divided into two parts, the lying half and the honest half, and if he is divided, by force he will die. Note two things. First, the episode recalls the balsam of Fiera Bras in Don Quixote Part 1, Chapter 10, suggesting that Cervantes' scheme was always going to span both parts of the novel. Second, like his initial humility at Barataria when he refused to accept the epithet Don, Sancho's final decision fulfills another aspect of Don Quixote's princely advice, when in doubt, error on the side of mercy. Sancho says this himself, that they should let him pass freely, for it is always more praiseworthy to do good than bad. A precept came into my memory, one among the many that Don Quixote told me the night before I came to be governor of this isle, which was that when justice is in doubt, I should lean toward and choose mercy. Sancho 
states that Don Quixote's advice was made for this particular case, fitting perfectly. The juridical aphorism on display here is in dubio pro reo, a principle of criminal justice. A defendant is innocent until proven guilty. The Duke's Majordomo compares the governor favorably to Lycurgus himself, and Sancho is proud to have resolved the matter so neatly. He says, bars unbent, meaning no harm, no foul. After the resolution of the paradox of the bridge, the narrator announces the end of Sancho's rule. The butler, planning to conclude with him that very night, playing the final joke on him for which he was commissioned. Cervantes concludes the Barataria allegory with a statement. Governance inevitably faces paradoxes, and one solution is to show mercy whenever possible. But we might ask, whom does he have in mind? And will not showing mercy cause people to take advantage of a tendency to not enforce the law? We'll find partial answers later. For now, realize that Cervantes is thinking of the Aragonese nobility of 1591 and the Morisco population in Southeast Spain around 1609. And remember our author's perspectivism. Life's hardest decisions are by definition never simple. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating novel. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.